Hope everybody's enjoying their summer. We're trying to balance between being more frequent with the videos and also completing some other projects that we've been working on, but we're going to put a pause on that so that we can deliver some more content. We got something about to come out that we're really excited to announce, but it's not quite ready yet. In the meantime, we're rolling out a little multi-part series, not too long, but a little suspense never hurt anyone. So consider this video the overture. We're about to delve into an alternative viewpoint of film history that's rarely explored. Our curiosity was piqued by the inconsistencies surrounding Alice Guy's films, or even Guy herself seemed unsure about her first film. Discrepancies and contradictions abound in these lost films. Take for instance that it's stated that more than 80% of the original silent era films have vanished, and before 1929, over 90% were lost forever. The reasons given? Film preservation difficulties, fires, studio bankruptcy leading to sudden disappearances, or studios remaking films and destroying earlier versions. But perhaps there's something more occult or hidden going on here. Film historians, while specialists in their field, often overlook the occult symbolism or the involvement of secret societies in these early studios. The vast majority of remaining silent films are rife with occult symbolism, an area in dire need of research. While researching for a certain lost film, which we'll dive deeper into in our next video, we stumbled upon an interesting reoccurring pattern. Before we can break that down, let's explore a mind-boggling premise. Theaters are not just entertainment venues, they're occult mental programming machines and to a further extent, initiation rituals. Sounds like the usual Freemason conspiracy theory, right? But hold on to your skepticism for a bit. Our entire societal structure can be viewed as a Freemasonic ritual. It starts with elementary school, where we learn the elements, magic, and spelling, moving on into middle school, the three grades, the middle pillar, and culminates in high school, the zenith of the process. There's another initiation deeply ingrained in nearly every city and state in America, Remember the Odd Fellows video? Most people equate secret societies only with Freemasons. However, there are many different clubs out there. The Odd Fellows and Freemasonic Lodges dot every downtown. While each town has its own narrative about the establishment of these lodges, there's never been a clear explanation as to why they're so widespread. This facet of history remains untouched by mainstream researchers pushing it into the realm of alternative history. Just as Oddfellow Lodges and Orphanages are a common sight across American cities, there's another enigma awaiting to be unveiled. The mystery of ISIS theaters. During the early 1900s, coinciding with the rise of film studios capable of producing short movies, a surge of theaters emerged across America. What's peculiar is that in a substantial number of towns, the first theater was an ISIS theater, a reoccurring pattern that's hard to overlook. Contrary to what one might think, ISIS theater isn't a chain like Macy's, for which historical records are easily available. Try looking up ISIS theater history or ISIS cinema, and you'll encounter a fragmented collection of individual histories for each town, with the most detailed one being about the downtown Fort Worth location in Texas. Interestingly, none of these accounts mention the existence of ISIS theaters in other towns, giving an impression of exclusivity which is far from reality. A glance at the history of cinema in the United States on Wiki doesn't mention ISIS theater at all, which raises eyebrows considering their prevalence in numerous states. It's as if this is a piece of history that has been deliberately omitted or forgotten. Strangely, Wiki says that the first permanent motion picture theater was Tally's Electric Theater in Los Angeles in 1902, but evidence suggests that ISIS theaters predate this, with one in Victor, Colorado as early as 1899. What they will say is that the first cinema chain is Warrenberg Theaters, first set up in 1906 with the opening of the Cherokee Theater in St. Louis, Missouri by former blacksmith Fred Warrenberg. Now that's an interesting story on its own, 
and we've seen this use of blacksmith many times in the past as with the Charleston video, but the whole story is that Fred went to the World's Fair and saw something that changed his life. He was just a one-time blacksmith saloon grocery butcher shop owner inspired by a simple film clip of passengers on a train who then decides to purchase a bakery and transform it into a movie theater. One can't help but wonder what was this film really about? There's more to that story, but I just bring it up to show you this is what wiki and mainstream history says is the first cinema chain. So we know there's a lack of information. These ISIS theaters were a crucial part of many cities, even small towns. Why is there not more information on them? Interestingly, when doing research for Pensacola, I remember seeing that there was this ISIS theater in this old picture book. Moon and I both thought that it was very strange that there was an old theater in Pensacola called ISIS Theater, but we never really investigated it any further. It wasn't until later, after connecting it with lost films and alternative film history, that it became clear there was something to this whole mystery. For those wondering why ISIS comes across as an odd choice of name, we're not referring to any modern day groups bearing the name ISIS. Rather, we're pointing to what seems to be a distinct reference to Freemasonry. As we'll explain shortly, ISIS is an integral part of initiation ceremonies and Masonic practices. Well, let's begin our exploration with Pensacola because the situation there is genuinely puzzling. When we search for the oldest cinema theater in Florida, results are surprisingly sparse. The earliest contenders appear to be the Florida Theater and the Sunray Cinema, both in Jacksonville, Florida, with nothing documented before 1920. Sunray holds the reputation of being the earliest cinema to showcase talking pictures or synchronized sound, a claim that I believe is still open to debate. When you look up the earliest Pensacola cinema or movie theater, nothing significant appears. Notably, Isis Theater won't show up unless you already know about it. That may change in the future, but as of now, the first result from Pensapedia points to Florida Theater, akin to Jacksonville's, but this one dates back to 1939. However, the credibility of these dates is suspect since many of these buildings reportedly underwent renovations relocations, or conversions from an existing business or structure into a theater. Let's take a closer look at Pensacola. Most locals would know about the Sanger Theater, the city's most iconic theater, right at the heart of downtown and opened in 1925, yet the Isis Theater was opening over a decade earlier. It's even considered the sister theater and was supposedly owned by the Sanger Amusement Company. However, this acquisition didn't happen until 1935. So what was Isis Theater before this? As per Pensapedia, it was a movie theater built in 1913. This would make it the oldest theater in Pensacola, preceding both Sanger and Rex, and it wasn't even for plays, it was for movies. In this old photo, you can see that they even had synchronized music. You can also spot a trolley advertisement for Scaramouche, a two-hour movie from 1923 dramatizing the societal and class tensions leading to a French Revolution. And guess where the Isis Theater was located? Right in front of the Freemason Building in Pensacola, on Garden and Palafox. While this alone doesn't confirm the theater's Freemasonic affiliation, it's noteworthy, especially considering the Freemason Building is among the oldest downtown Pensacola structures. Yet again, why such scant information? This was the first theater, yet it doesn't appear when searching for the oldest theater in Pensacola. So is this unknown, lost history? Or is it suppressed history? Let's now delve into the extensive list of ISIS theaters, as their prevalence is quite remarkable. Strangely, not many appear on Google Maps, likely due to their diminished existence, which also means they don't often feature in top search results. However, a basic Google search for ISIS theaters will yield about 10 different ones, each possessing a unique history that seems disconnected from the others. Among the ones that typically appear include Fort Worth, Texas, home to an ISIS theater dating back to 1914. Aspen, Colorado hosts an ISIS theater from 1912. Victor, Colorado also had an ISIS theater as far back as 1899. Winnemac, Indiana 
as the nicest theater established in 1936. Crete, Nebraska, a 1926 ISIS theater, notably the first building with AC. The history page intriguingly concedes that the Isis theaters are named after the Egyptian goddess Isis, leaving no doubt about the name's origin. The city had a population of only 2,000 in 1920. One might wonder why such a small town needed an Isis theater. Asheville, North Carolina, home to an Isis theater from 1937. These particular ones are more prominent because they're still in use. For instance, the lesser-known Pensacola Isis Theater does not appear in searches unless one is already familiar with its history. Well, here is a more detailed list of Isis Theaters. Toledo, Colorado. The new theater was opened around 1937. It was renamed Isis Theater and was listed in the 1941 and 1943 editions of Film Daily Yearbook as closed, and it was operated by the Atlas Theater Corp chain. It had reopened by 1950. Denver, Colorado, 1913. In 1953, it was briefly renamed New State Theater. Fort Worth, Texas, 1914. The theater designed by Louis B. Wayman had 400 seats, one screen, a pharmacy, and 12 rooms upstairs. Houston, Texas, 1912. Gainesville, Texas, 1915. Salt Lake City, 1908. Glendale, Montana, 1914. Arnold, Nebraska, 1924, which is weird because the population today is like 500. Same thing in Broadwater, Nebraska, 1916. Augusta, Kansas, 1913. McPherson, Kansas, 1909. Seattle, Washington, opened up sometime before 1914. New Orleans, Louisiana, 1920s, could see over 800 people, but no photos of the place exist. Deming, New Mexico, 1918. Independence, Oregon, unknown date. Portland, Oregon, 1909. Medford, Oregon, 1910. Oklahoma City, 1921. Kansas City, Missouri, 1918. Roanoke, Virginia, 1917. Lynchburg, Virginia, 1916. Grand Rapids, Michigan, 1916. From the St. Paul, Minnesota 1916 newspaper, he talks about the Isis Theater receiving multiple donations, but doesn't specify where it's located. Interestingly, there is a 1916 theater in St. Paul called the Palace Theater or the RKO Orpheum. Minneapolis, Minnesota 1909. Fargo, North Dakota 1913. There's some interesting Glendive, Montana newspapers from 1914. Something strange about a master key show in the last days of Pompeii. So, why are they talking about Pompeii? Interestingly, Isis Theater was advertised in the 1917 Juno newspaper from Alaska. Kind of strange when you think about it. St. John's, Arizona, 1914. Nogales, Arizona, 1913. And it's difficult to say whether there was one in Phoenix or not. From the Prescott Weekly, Arizona, 1905, there's an article on the Isis Theater in Tent City. It's not clear exactly where this may be, but seems there were multiple Isis Theaters in Arizona. Lawrence, Arizona, 1923. San Bernardino, California, 1914. Balboa, California. Ontario, California. Even Los Angeles, 1911. But one of the most intriguing examples of Isis theaters is found in San Diego. This theater, seemingly one of the largest and possibly oldest, is referenced frequently in historical newspapers across various states. Initially opened as the Fisher Opera House in 1892, it was subsequently transformed into an Isis theater in 1902. From the University of Toledo, there's a picture of an interior of the Isis Theater from this era that seems to be a rare find. It says that it's in Point Loma, California, and no exact date but between 1896 and 1929, and this kind of exposes the whole thing. The description calls it a theosophical theater, an occult theater, occult revival, and look at the interior and how fancy this is. 
Look at the size of the screen. It's all pretty impressive. But wait. So these theaters are a cult then? There's more to cover. Panama City, Florida. Orlando, Florida. Boise, Idaho, 1912. Peru and Noblesville, Indiana, around 1914. Fort Wayne, Indiana, 1913. Indianapolis, 1910, which features a peacock-looking building. Des Moines, Iowa, 1914. Cedar Rapids, Iowa, 1913. Hamilton County, Iowa, 1911. Interestingly, the backstory here says that it was started by two men, F.L. Freely and H.L. Wise, that these were the men who chose the name Isis, but that seems just like a cover story because there were many more before this. Marion, Illinois, started by a coal miner in 1916. So this is the last one, but supposedly, there's one in Chicago, but it's sort of a mystery. There's zero information on it online, but there's a newspaper article. This is pretty mind-blowing. From 1926, quote, New Isis Theater planned for heart of large territory. Ada and 69th Street site brought 40,000 from Movie Palace Building Corporation. There's probably no district in Chicago so thickly populated as the immediate neighborhood of 69th and Ada Streets that lacks amusement facilities as does the community in which the Isis Theater and Building Corporation will erect its 750,000 1800 seat theater and office building. When completed, the new theater on the southeast corner of 69th and Ada Streets will be operated by the ISIS interest or turned over to one of the large theater corporations now operating in Chicago, according to W.J. McDonnell, who represented both parties in the transfer of the property. The site was purchased for a reported price of $8,000. Z. E. Roll Smith has been secured as the architect to draw plans for the theater in the 15 apartments, 7 stores, and 4 offices which will occupy the building. The theater, both as to exterior and interior finish, has been designed in the Egyptian style, following closely the original model of the temple to the goddess Isis on the island of Philae above the first cataract of the Nile. The temple was first built by Nekhenef, the last of the native Egyptian kings, about the year 350 BC. The Roman emperor Justinian closed its altars in the 6th century AD. End quote. But the crazy thing is that they feature an artist's rendering of what it's supposed to look like, and to me, it looks like old Photoshop. You can even see that the sign is slightly cut off. Why would they feature this, even secure an architect? There doesn't seem to be any more info on this ISIS theater other than this newspaper article. But notice how cold it looks, like some Egyptian temple. And there are many more ISIS theaters. Not every one of them is on a catalog, and sometimes the newspapers are the only source for info on these theaters. You would think in a time where they were showing cinema as new technology that they would have a solid historical record of these theaters, but we really don't. Almost every ISIS theater on this list is shrouded in mystery or very few details exist. Just to clarify, this isn't to suggest that Isis theaters were the sole purveyors of occult themes in theaters or that there were no other theaters during this era. Certainly, many supposedly competing theaters existed in various cities. Some early cinema books even describe this, showing other theaters that exhibited similar occult or royal symbols. One such instance seems to be a variant of the Isis theater named the Iris Theater. It appears to be the same entity but tweaked slightly to create an illusion of competition because interestingly, Iris Theater bears a striking resemblance to Isis Theaters. Before delving into the significance of all this, it's crucial to recognize that Isis Theaters were, in most instances, the first or earliest cinema theaters in the United States. However, it remains unexplained why these theaters sprouted up in so many different cities especially smaller towns with relatively low population counts. Some of these theaters could accommodate hundreds of people. It raises the question, were entire towns attending these movies? Interestingly, the book Landscape Architecture in the Modern World 
from 1941 references the Isis Theater. It is listed as number 66. Quote, Sponsors of the Isis Theater in Point Loma assert that it was the first truly Greek theater built in America, designed and constructed by Catherine Tingley in 1901. The picture associated with this entry depicts a substantial structure that bears a strong resemblance to a Greek temple. End quote. So it appears that this theater dates back to 1901, and it's the first Greek theater in America. But wait, Point Loma was that interior photo that we saw earlier in San Diego. So this is what it looked like from the outside? Try searching Point Loma Isis Theater. The only thing that comes up in catalogs is Loma Theater in San Diego from 1945. So what's going on here? Well, there's an enlightening page from the San Diego History Center about the history of the first Greek theater in America at Point Loma, California. We might finally be getting closer to an understanding of what these Isis theaters are, thanks to this source. However, note that this information is still not connecting the Isis theaters from other cities, making it a localized explanation. Here's a quote from the source. Quote, The Greek theater which is today located on the California Western University campus, is perhaps one of the most majestic and inspiring edifices in Southern California. Although it is situated just above the surf of the Pacific, it did not spring from the ocean as its situation might provoke the imagination to believe. There is a fascinating history behind the awesome splendor of this theater which dates back to 1901. In 1897, Madame Catherine Tingley purchased a sanitarium from Dr. Lauren Wood. It was Madame Tingley's dream to found an Athens of the West at Point Loma. A dynamic woman who believed in working to make her dream a reality, Madame Tingley became the leader of the Theosophical Society in 1896, and in February 1898 changed the name to the Universal Brotherhood in Theosophical Society. After purchasing the sanitarium, she changed his name to the Academy and used it as a living quarters and as a schoolroom for the fine arts. In 1900, she completed the construction of this building by adding a stained glass dome and then built the circular Temple of Peace situated next to the Academy. Soon after the completion of the structure, excavations were begun at the head of a natural canyon for a Greek theater. The first soil was turned on July 1, 1901. Little digging was actually needed because of the canyon's original shape. By November of 1901, 11 semicircular tiers of wood had been erected. The ground which the amphitheater was built was packed down and used for calisthenics and as a meeting center." End quote. So that ties everything together. These theaters were initiated by Theosophists, which confirms the Isis symbolism the occult connection. Catherine Tingley was also responsible for the School for the Revival of the Lost Mysteries of Antiquity. Her Wikipedia page reveals an interesting character. She took legal action against her critics to the point where no one dared to attack her publicly. She established several theosophical branch centers in America and Europe. So, what were these theosophists doing with these early movie theaters? So what was the first movie theater in America? Reportedly it was in New Orleans in 1896, yet this fact raises more questions than answers. The theater, named Vitascope Hall, housed 400 seats in a projector. However, this history wasn't uncovered by the city or state historical society, but rather by independent researchers who stumbled upon a 1912 article in 1996. It took until 2020 for a historical marker to be established. The question arises, why does it fall to independent researchers discover such crucial pieces of our historical puzzle? What does the archive department even do? Moreover, the interior of Vitascope Hall is quite large. It does not appear to be the first attempt at such an endeavor. And what films were screening at this time? In 1896, American cinema was essentially non-existent. The few films that did exist were French, and the details about them, much like Alice Guy and the Cabbage Fairy, have been lost. 
Were they simply playing short films at Vitascope Hall? It's worth noting that these early film technologies were initially showcased at world fairs, such as the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago, a seminal event in the history of early film technology. At this fair, there were multiple demonstrations of nascent cinematic devices. Even Thomas Edison's kinetoscope was on display. Though it wasn't the official unveiling of the technology, this device was essentially a peep show apparatus wherein viewers could watch a short film through a viewing slot on the top of the machine. In the early 1890s, the Fantascope emerged and was presented at the Cotton States and International Exposition in Atlanta in 1895. The Fantascope projected a film that Charles Jenkins had shot in his own backyard, a film named Annabelle's Butterfly Dance, and every frame was allegedly colorized according to a 1918 book by Homer Croy. However, contradictions soon arose. A film historian, Terry Ramsey, in 1926 questioned this claim, as the dancer reportedly featured in the film had never danced for Jenkins. Ramsey couldn't find the newspaper Croy cited, not even in Jenkins' personal scrapbook. However, a successful projection in 1895 was confirmed. Now, the concept here is that this technology was in its nascent stage and within a short period, the same type of theaters sprang up all across the United States. It's highly unlikely that these theaters were being built from scratch. They were probably existing properties that were renovated into theaters. It could even be argued that this technology was hijacked. The technology wasn't brand new. Magic lanterns, projectors that used slides, had been used since 1659 for both entertainment and education. The only significant difference with the later technology was the use of film and the kinetoscope attachment, which moved the film along to create the illusion of movement. These magic lanterns did show moving pictures to a degree, movies or entertainment, and there were catalogs in private collections. Different types of magic lanterns existed all employing various mechanisms for creating movement. Some examples of these include a sliding magic lantern with animation from 1890 showing a young boy and girl on a seesaw. These animated slides serve as testament to the fact that they understood the concept of frame-by-frame -frame animation quite well, long before traditional cinema took root. Some of these slides even had a mechanism for rotation with a simple turn of a handle you could get a fluid animation. In fact, if we go back to 1833, we encounter the Fina Kistoscope, often hailed as the first widespread animation device and the first form of moving media entertainment. Yes, it's true that flexible film credited to George Eastman in 1885 supposedly took a long time to develop and is touted as the reason movies took so long to emerge. But the film Eastman invented wasn't plastic, it was paper with the coating. Is it possible that cinema existed much earlier and was simply kept from the public eye? Magic lanterns, which share the same concept as a camera obscura, are likely ancient in origin. We know that the camera obscura dates back to the 11th century with Alhazen's Book of Optics, the oldest reference to a camera. So can we trust the narrative that it took almost a thousand years to figure out frame-by-frame -frame animation? Worth noting is that magic lanterns are mentioned in Plato's Liber Vacae, indicating that they might go even further back than the Arabic medieval scholars. The notion that emerges from all this is that film history has been heavily distorted and manipulated. The first theaters in America, or at least the ones recorded in our history, were occult theaters. Isis is an Egyptian goddess, but it also represents a free Masonic initiation ritual, supposedly dating back to ancient times. The mysteries of Isis were religious initiation rites carried out in the cult of the Egyptian goddess Isis in the Greco-Roman world. They borrowed from other mystery rites, notably the Eleusinian mysteries known for their ritualistic use of drugs to induce altered states of consciousness. It's crucial to remember that the mysteries of Isis were secret initiation rituals. These initiations frequently involved intense experiences 
like nocturnal darkness being broken by bright light or loud music that causes disorientation in an intense religious experience. Strangely enough, this seems remarkably similar to the early cinematic experiences. Initiates were instructed not to discuss the details of their experiences, so our understanding of these ancient rites is limited due to their inherent secrecy. While these rites may originate from Egyptian or Greco-Roman mysteries, they still have relevance to Freemasons today. Freemasonry is believed to have roots in Egypt, as evidenced by the oldest known Masonic text. The Halliwell Manuscript, also known as the Regis Poem, dated between 1390 and 1425. This document posits that the craft of masonry began with Euclid in Egypt and found its way to England during the reign of King Ethelstan in the 10th century. In 1877, Helena Blavatsky authored Isis Unveiled, a book that delves into the master key to the mysteries of both ancient and modern science and theology. Initially titled The Veil of Isis, the name was changed due to an existing 1861 Rosicrucian work by W. W. Reed. While Blavatsky was not a Freemason, her work inspired many other occult societies, including the Masons. The Master Key revealed in her book is seen as the secret to occult powers and forces unknown to science. Freemasonry, with its unique system of rituals and initiations, has notably influenced the arts, particularly music and theater. Renowned composers like Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart and Ludwig van Beethoven, both active Freemasons, infused their compositions with Masonic principles. In the 18th century, opera served as the influential medium of artistic expression, combining music, drama, and the visual arts in a way that captivated audiences. It was inevitable that Masonic themes would permeate this vibrant and immersive art form. Opera composers like Mozart, a recognized Freemason, frequently utilized the operatic stage to subtly express Masonic themes and ideologies. A prime example that links the Egyptian mysteries to Freemasonry is Mozart's opera, The Magic Flute, often interpreted as an allegory for Masonic initiation abundant with Masonic symbols and rituals. The plot centers around Tamino, who endures trials of virtue and strength to prove his worth. His journey mirrors the Masonic initiation rites wherein candidates progress through stages to attain enlightenment and brotherhood. In the opera, Isis, the Egyptian goddess of wisdom and initiation, is recurrently invoked. Tamino and Pamina symbolizing the essential interdependence of male and female, embark on their initiation into the temple as a unified androgynous being to uncover the mysteries of the gods. Quote, Triumph, triumph, you noble couple. You have overcome the trials. Initiates of Isis now. Come, enter into the temple. End quote. Interestingly, early theaters were often called Orpheums, derived from Orpheus or the House of Orpheus. Orpheus was famed for his mastery of the lyre, said to enchant gods, humans, animals, and even rocks. Orpheus also lends his name to the Orphic Mysteries or Orphism, a mystery cult focused on the deified Orpheus. Much like the Egyptian rites, Orphism also had secret initiation rituals. It's intriguing to find not one, with two clear symbolic connections to secret societies in early American film and entertainment history. And let's not forget Isis and the moon. The association between the moon and illusion is undeniable, and this connection lends itself to the appropriateness of the name Isis for a theater housing a silver screen. The choice of silver as the metal associated with the moon further enhances the occult symbolism intertwined with such a cinematic setting. Isis is linked to magic, healing, and fertility, and she also embodies the mystical qualities that align with the enchantment and transformative power of cinema. Just as Isis was believed to possess the ability to create illusions and manipulate reality, 
Movies crafted on the silver screen have the potential to transport audiences into extraordinary worlds, evoking a sense of wonder and suspending disbelief. Moreover, silver traditionally connected to the moon in various mystical rites and traditions accentuates the occult undertones of a theater named Isis. The moon's silvery light reflects the ethereal glow of the silver screen, emphasizing the celestial-terrestrial mirror connection that reinforces the transcendent nature of the cinematic experience. Also, Nickelodeons are, in a way, the modern successors to the venues that hosted ancient mysteries. These small cinema theaters often repurposed storefronts, would charge five cents for admission. While not the first indoor theaters, they do bear an intriguing connection to the term Odeon, an ancient Greek or Roman term for a roofed theater. Given the massive scale of these ancient theaters, the comparison is nothing short of fascinating. Despite the reputation of America as a predominantly Christian nation during this period, many theaters featuring occult themes were prevalent. The Isis Theater, as we've discovered, was a theosophical occult theater, one of many emerging in the early histories of various American cities. These theaters' presence during a period strongly identified with Protestant or Catholic values raises eyebrows, especially given the proximity of these theaters to downtown churches, creating a perplexing contradiction. Oddly, there seems to be a lack of videos discussing this historical aspect. With little to no coverage on YouTube and scarce sources available online, and even those that do exist fail to present this topic in its full context. Why were there so many ISIS theaters? Is there a connection to Freemasonry? Why is so little information available, and from what can be found, none of it connects with other local histories? Could it be that film history has been deliberately obscured? Perhaps this technology existed long before we believe, serving both as a form of entertainment for the wealthy elite and as a secret initiation ceremony for future members. Over the decades, this clandestine art could have slipped into the realm of the occult or hidden, veiled from the public eye. Another theory is that these theaters hosted secret occult ceremonies that employed the art of cinema to induce altered states of consciousness. The elaborate interior design of the Point Loma Isis Theater, replete with quality, symbolic references, seems excessive for merely watching movies. Alternatively, there may have been a higher form of this art, a mystical and secret occult practice where initiates watch these films in altered states, engaging in a kind of magic. This occult practice may have been lost to history due to its secretive nature. So we're curious, is there an ISIS theater near you? What do you think's going on with these theaters? Let us know your thoughts in the comments, and all we can hope is that our minds may be unveiled. Let go of everything you think to be true. Relax the mind and ask the question, do I truly understand what this reality is?